page 44 in Deadly by Julie Shabaro, October 12, 1906. Finally, 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 a miracle has happened. Finally, to me, late this week, I received notice in the mail from my interviewer that I was indeed chosen to be his assistant. He asked me to meet him at his office on Friday to talk about the job. I was so happy to see him again. To look into his serious face, and I could barely contain my joy. I stood at his desk, my hat in my, my hat in hand, watching the strong muscles twitch in his jaw. Miss Galowski, he said, before you agree to take on this work, I would like to make it clear to you that I am not hiring you as a secretary. Instead, I'm looking for someone who can come with me to disease sites to help me to investigate crimes, uh, to investigate causes. His words frightened me for a moment. I told him I was not any kind of expert. He shook his head. I need an assistant, a note taker, who can also be a participant. And I'm asking you to use your brain. Not just type out those words I dictate, but to help me think through the causes. The description thrilled me, thrilled the words for me. I could only nod in agreement. He handed me a folio in which he to take notes. He said, the office has just been engaged in a typhoid fever investigation and I'll need your services immediately. Monday at 8 in the Antimeritum. We will meet in the office and ride a motor carriage out to Long Island where the household where a household has taken ill with disease. I thought of Marm and school and I found myself unable to remind him of the half day responsibility to attend. Sir, I will be there on Monday at 8, I said. He explained that he'd been away on an epidemic hunt, which it was why I spent the last intolerable weeks waiting word from him. Up in Peekskill, he tested the water pipes. Those running in and out of houses, he traced their paths all the way back to the city's reservoir. That reservoir provides Peekskill with drinking water. Mr. Soper discovered that a builder was allowing his workers to bathe and defecate in the reservoir, thus tainting the drinking water. Nearly the whole town contracted cholera. A number of the weaker peak skillers due to excessive diarrhea and vomiting. I must get used to these medical words as my interviewer uses them freely. I'm mostly young children and elderly folks died of dehydration, which is an effect of cholera. I didn't show my emotion, but a part of me cringed to hear him talk of deaths, and I questioned myself. Do I really want to take on another job that includes such sorrow? These things go badly when our mothers or babies die. A wild sadness comes over me, a feeling I can't shake for days. But this job will be different. Here, I will be taking steps to fighting death. He dismissed them. He dismissed me then, and I left the office charged with a sense of awe at the job, at the man who entrusted it to me. He holds tight, he holds tight, his mustachioed face, his moody, watchful eyes closed to me. He has a darkness about him, no doubt, from witnessing such illness, but beneath that seems to lie a great caring. When I arrived home, I told Marm about our meeting, and she immediately objected to the work hours and the travel, and I could see it striking her, the turn of her mouth changing, the pinch surfacing on her brow. Don't you have to be in school at eight in the morning, she asked. When I told Marm that I'd promised to meet Mr. Soper, she said, Prudence, the rules of your school state that you may take an afternoon position. You cannot be there in the morning. I must. You must tell him that. She folded her arms. And I don't like you going in a motor carriage with a stranger, a grown man. I felt the job slipping away from me at Marm's protests. I saw the reason for her doubts, but I want, I need the job, so I argued with her. If I were a boy, you are not a boy. You're a girl in her last year of school, and this is not what we agreed on. Marm raised her voice. I don't hear her shout often and never at me. But I want this job more, much more than school, I cried. Marm lowered her eyelids at me. She has worked for years to maintain my standing in the school, and she's, she tends to expectant mothers for months, only to collect a small sum at the birthing session. Then every fall and spring, she has to pay for school clothes and for the boots I wear. 
money for books and pencils and paper, and she never complains. She thinks it's worth it, it that's, that it's a finer school than any of the free schools, and that it will lead me to a better job than hers one day. But I pressed on. I don't learn anything, Mom. Just bookkeeping in French and how to order a household of servants. There is no work for the girls, for girls in the sciences, she insisted. She struck the table with the flat of her hand and said, You absolutely cannot take the job. I will not allow it, Prudence. I burst out, If I were a boy like Benny, you would let me take it. I saw her suck in her breath as if I had hit her. Marm, I cried, Marm, please. I was sorry I'd brought up Benny, but I had to make her understand. She stared at me, her lips pressed so hard together that they turned white. I softened my voice. Benny is the reason I want the job, Marm. I need to know why he died. I need to understand. Marm stood so still that I was afraid she had stopped breathing. I asked her if we could talk to Mrs. Browning. Perhaps we could convince her to allow me to finish my lessons on my own time, to remain in school. It, it was such a rare chance. I had brought up Jacob Reese and all the good things the Department of Health and Sanitation had done for the city. I clutched my hands together, and I waited. Marm said finally, we will go see Mrs. Browning privately to hear what she says, but you must listen to her verdict. If she does not agree, you must stay in school. I hugged my own waist and I held in my reply. Marm turned away from me and started supper, and we spoke no more of it. We have a meeting with Mrs. Browning this evening in her parlor. I can't help it. I feel angry at Marm. She was the one who taught me all about the body and illness, and she encouraged me to use my brain, and she showed me how to pry into scientific matters, to be curious always. Now, she wants me to be a bookkeeper. Why? Most office girls hire typists the way they they would buy a vase of flowers. Doesn't Marm want me to be smarter than that? My interviewer goes that one step further. He asks me to get my brain involved. It is unusual, I agree. But its very strangeness is what makes it so special. I feel as if Marm has dropped me from a tall tower, as if she no longer is beside me. I can't find a foothold as to what, it, what is right, to take the job and possibly have to leave schools, or to not take the job and be miserable for the rest of my life. I wish I didn't have to choose between school and work.